right, folks, this is Steve with The Rogue Scholar, and I'm really, really thrilled today to bring on my friend Fadl Kaboob, Dr. Fadl Kaboob, who has been literally all over the place. He joined us here recently a couple times. We were able to put a an older uh, broadcast that Fadl put out regarding inflation. We had a Real Progressives Live for all of you to come see for a webinar where Fadl talked extensively about inflation. It's good to see the Bri, uh, you know, Brianna Joy Gray going out there and putting this out there. It's good to see Sabby Sabs and others. Dr. Hale had uh, Fadl on last night, and it looks like Sabby's got him on tonight. I got him on for our lunch break today, and we're not going to talk about just inflation because obviously inflation is the hot button of the day. But what we're going to talk about instead is how this looks in the framework of the United States, Green New Deal, and the Global South, which Fadl is an expert in. So without further ado, Fadl, welcome, buddy. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me back on the show. Absolutely. Well, you know what? You've never been on this show. This is a new show. Well, We're doing this yeah. thing at lunchtime, trying really hard to uh, create a little space over the lunch break, hoping that people will be able to find time to be able to learn this stuff, listen while they're eating lunch and, you know, see what happens. It's a new thing. We'll give it a shot. Um, so, Fado, you are very busy and I do appreciate your time coming on here and you've given us an inordinate amount of time. So, again, double plus thank yous. Um, Talk to me about the Green New Deal. We, we've talked about it at length regarding the layer cake, how, how the Green New Deal is a stack or a framework or a scaffolding of many ideas and concepts that work in unison together to both tackle the environment, but also tackle the human resource element. Would you explain to us what, in fact, the Green New Deal is? Very good question. And I'm glad you, you started the conversation by highlighting the, the hot button kind of issue of the day, which is inflation. And today I'd like to invite you and all the listeners to think of the Green New Deal framework as an anti-inflation uh, macroeconomic policy. Uh, a lot of people think of the Green New Deal as, uh, you know, the climate change policy, the inequality policy, it's, which is true. It's all of the above. But the way we've structured the MMT Green New Deal proposal and the MMT community has always been centered on how do we achieve all of these great things, fight climate change, address inequality, uh, introduce social justice types of policies, healthcare policies, but do all of this with an eye towards the risk of inflation, because that's what MMT is all about. MMT is simply saying that the sovereign government has the spending capacity and that it's not constrained by tax revenues or borrowing capacity, but it's rather constrained by the risk of inflation, which is determined by the availability of real resources, real productive capacity, coupled with what I call the abusive market power. So if we're successful at building productive capacity, in key areas of the economy, renewable energy, housing, uh, health care, education, whatever the areas are. And if we're able to do that and at the same time tame the abuse of market power and reinforce antitrust laws, then we're able to expand the fiscal policy space and achieve all of these goals without causing inflation. And just to close this kind of introductory remark here with, in the case of the U.S., when we were designing the Green New Deal proposal, we were thinking, OK, what are the key sources of inflation in the U.S. in the last couple of decades? It's healthcare, it's housing, it's education and it's energy and transportation. So it's no surprise that the Green New Deal framework includes as core features a policy for Medicare for all. Number one, to increase productive capacity. Number two, to tax and regulate abusive market power, reduce concentration and abuse in the private healthcare industry. Number two, it's no surprise that the Green New Deal framework includes housing for all, which is a comprehensive public housing policy to increase the availability of affordable housing, high quality affordable housing, sustainable housing, and to introduce a regulatory framework, uh, which includes rent controls and, and things like that to reduce the abuse of market power, to reduce the speculative behavior, and the real estate market. It's no surprise that the Green New Deal includes college for all, right? To uh, tame the, uh, reduce the inflationary pressure from the private uh, for-profit college education, the exclusive 
nature of the industry, uh, and so on. And finally, decarbonizing the system, which is another key area of inflation in the U.S., energy and transportation, and reducing the abuse of market power of the oil and gas industry and, 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 and so on. So all the core components of the Green New Deal Yes, they do decarbonize the system. Yes, they do reduce inequality and restructure the economy on a more sustainable path, but they primarily are designed in a way that reduces the inflation pressure points in those areas. So every time you think of macroeconomic policy from an MMT perspective, you want to achieve both the, the social and economic and ecological goals, but you also want to keep in mind where the sources of inflation are and tackle them with the right policies, whether it's increasing productive capacity, whether it's taxing and regulating abusive market power, um, that's how you can achieve all the above without bankrupting the country or causing inflation and hurting the more vulnerable eventually with, with higher inflation rates. So that's kind of an, in way of introduction in the context of the US. But of course, these are yes. global issues, not just the US. That's right. And that's where I want to go with this, right? I, I have become like, I'm just going to say it outright, infatuated with our guy, Jason Hickel. He has a way of presenting the global picture. I look for you guys for the economics, but he has a way of painting out that socio-political vision, that eco uh, vision, if you will. And he really, I, I got to give him credit. He really, really not exposed me, but really took me to a place where it mattered about the IMF, the WTO, and the World Bank, and the role in which these U.S. machinations, these U.S.-led machinations, really, in fact, destroy the sovereignty of the global South, have really rendered them unable to enjoy the fruits of their own labor, and really have wrecked their ability um, to, you know, to, to flourish, to survive um, based on the structural adjustments that are imposed on these developing nations by the IMF. This is a core component, however, of U.S. imperial dominance in terms of resource extraction, in terms of clearing markets. This whole neoliberal framework has really had a dramatic impact, not only on the carbon footprint because of going all the way south, extracting, and, and all the carbon that comes out, plus the policing with the military, et cetera. What is the impact of the United States, in particular, on the global south and their ability to participate in us as a, as a globe surviving this, this catastrophe? I mean, we know the economics, at least I think we understand the U.S.-based, but how does it impact the global society? Very good question. Well, it, it, as a matter of fact, I mean, the U.S. is kind of the, the more recent uh, incarnation of this force that you're describing, but its original kind of um, uh, sources are colonial sources. So British, European colonialism and, and the global south. And after World War II, obviously, the U.S. became the most uh, influential country politically, economically, in terms of its military uh, influence. But in terms of its influence in global economic policy via the IMF, via the World Bank, and, and now more recently via the WTO policies. So for me, it's helpful to think of this as colonial and neo-colonial economic policies, not just kind of the more recent neoliberal reincarnation of these forces. So to answer your question, and, and I, I echo uh, all your sentiments about uh, Jason Hickel, Hickel and, and his work, uh, in, in this space on, on degrowth and MMT and, and kind of global framework for reparations. And what many of us have been saying is essentially the root causes of a lot of the problems that we have today, whether it's global inequality, whether it's uh, uh, socioeconomic exclusion and neglect and the global debt crisis and the global south, external debt crisis, the ecological crisis, all of these things have their origins in colonial and neo-colonial policies. And that's why we've been calling for a reparations framework, a, a reparations framework for colonial debt and a reparations framework for climate debt. So uh, when we take today the global economy and divide it into rich and poor countries, global south and global north, and net out all the financial transactions, uh, including you know, uh, trade, uh, foreign direct investment, uh, debt payments, charity, uh, foreign aid, you name it, everything. The net amount that we find is at least $2 trillion annually 
moving from the poorest countries to the richest countries. So under the current global financial architecture, the international trade architecture, when we have $2 trillion being extracted from the poorest to the richest, there's no way we're going to be able to tackle climate change or to tackle global inequality or a pandemic or any of the big issues that we're dealing with. So that flow has to at least reverse. And that's why we've been calling for debt cancellation, for external debt for countries in, in the global south, and reparations in the form of not just transfer of financial resources from rich to poor countries, but a, a repairing of the global financial architecture that stops the extractive nature of the global system and reparations in the sense of repairing the broken economic and ecological systems in the global south by transferring financial resources, technology and physical productive resources in order to build more resilient economies to repair the damage in the global south. So then it becomes a problem of identifying what are the broken systems, what are the kinds of uh, what is the, the nature of this global financial and international trade architecture that's sucking those $2 trillion from the global south? And when you identify those, you find that these are exactly the strategies, the policies that the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO have been advocating and enforcing and requiring as uh, conditional policies that must be applied in the global south in order to uh, not be excluded in order not to be punished in the global financial uh, system. So what are those policies? More free trade, meaning export-oriented growth, uh, foreign direct investment type of uh, growth, uh, openness to the international financial system, that is privatizing your financial system. Uh, openness to trade includes tourism, heavy reliance on tourism, and, and so on. All of these strategies, we're told, are strategies that help developing countries create jobs and earn foreign currency, dollars and euros and, and so on. Except in reality, these are traps, structural traps that created a situation where developing countries are increasingly more dependent on food imports, which is the biggest component of their external debt and their uh, current account deficit. Number two, they're uh, a huge, uh, hugely dependent on imports of energy. And that is true even for the biggest oil exporters like Mexico, like uh, uh, Nigeria and other big oil exporters. Why? Because they export crude oil and they import the refined version of petrochem uh, petrochemicals that they need, gasoline and kerosene and so on. And number three, which is related to this uh, uh, feature of the energy industry, the fact that developing countries typically specialize in exporting low value added content and importing high value added content in the manufacturing sector. So you're always trapped no matter what. You always export the low value added content and you import the high value added content. So what does that add up to? It adds up to uh, a, a rising external debt that constantly puts downward pressure on the currency of developing countries. And with the weaker currency, they become importers of inflation because everything they import, whether it's food or medicine or fuel, or basic necessities of any kind, they come with inflation embedded into it, which now forces the country to borrow even more dollars and euros and to subsidize basic necessities in order to avoid riots, essentially food riots and, and the next day. And that keeps the neo-colonial system alive and well and growing and keeps the flow of resources from the global south to the global north. So we're saying you need to tackle those by investing in food sovereignty and the global south to attack that one key component, which is the lack of food sovereignty. Number two, invest in renewable energy sovereignty in the global south to close that second component of the big structural deficit. And number three, avoid this excessive specialization and race to the bottom, specializing in low value added content with transfer of technology, with investment in resilience in the industrial sector so that the global south is not just the assembly line for the global north, but it's rather has its own uh, regional industrial strategy to build that resilience. And none of that is going to happen with minor contributions from the global north. It has to be substantial transfer of resources, financial and technological resources. And, and here I want to close with, with back to your first statement, which is 
how do we do all of this on a global scale without causing inflation and hyperinflation? And once again, this is where the MMT analysis of the theory of inflation becomes critical because inflation, again, it's about lack of available resources. And in the global south, that's primarily food and energy. Number two, it's about the abusive market power of domestic companies, uh, monopolies in some cases, um, uh, rent-seeking, uh, uh, you know, oligarchs in the global south. And number two, powerful, abusive price setters in the global system. I'll give you one example and I'll stop here. So we have to tackle that abusive market power if we're going to do all of this reparations globally without causing inflation. The food industry, globally, we have literally five mega corporations that control the entire global food system. So their pricing behavior, their um, uh, you know, dominance is detrimental to any effort we would put in place for a global reparations framework or a global Green New Deal or transfer of resources or building resilience. So we can't ignore the power and abuse and influence in politics, obviously, of these mega corporations. So that, that is to say, none of this is easy, but it's much, much easier to tackle these things once we know what the real obstacles are, rather than saying, oh, this is impossible, there's no money, and who is going to pay for it, and who are we going to tax, or who are we going to borrow from? So the MMT decouples the spending on the priorities, the taxing and regulating abusive power from the, uh, the concept of we need to tax them and borrow their money in order to fund all of these things. So I'll leave it at that as a kind of open, big opening statement about how to restructure <laughs> the global economy. It's a huge statement. I, and I want to touch on patents here in just a second, but I want to use do a use case or a case study real quick with you and to just sort of elaborate on what you were saying, because I think this is important. When I was finishing my MBA, one of our final projects was to do a, a global supply chain, to create a global supply chain. So they brought an alma mater in that allowed us to work on their actual company problem. And my job was to work with a company called Granite America. Granite America mills or gets their raw materials, their raw granite, other types of stones from South America. Mm -hmm. From South America, they take that and put it on huge ships that go across the world over to China, to a port in China, where they mill the, the raw materials into very specific countertops, whatever. In particular, this company was trying to build a new luxury retirement community along the uh you know mexican coastline right and so they typically would take that stuff from china into the ports in baltimore and then transport it from baltimore to wherever they were going well that was obviously cost prohibitive to go from baltimore to mexico so they were trying to find another route from china to mexico okay mm -hmm. so in this space you've got an american company acquiring real resources from South America, having it milled in China, having it transported back to America, then across ground to, to a foreign nation in Mexico. This is incredibly inefficient, but it's also representative of a typical supply chain. If you have this with life-saving materials like medicine, or you have this with electronics like semiconductors, you name it, in, yeah. in a global supply chain environment we're adding huge amounts of carbon by all this transportation getting it out of theater etc but we're also creating tremendous bottlenecks and breakpoints throughout that entire process how does this impact how would this uh, how would we redesign something like this so that we could make this green new deal address mm -hmm. this type of inefficiency baked into the supply chains of globalism very good question. So th this, as you know, this is kind of the, the whole concept of just in time, uh, I mean, just in time supply chains. And we see it in all kinds of products and pharmaceuticals and, and everything. And it's been the case for decades now. And of course, it's the lean and mean type of strategy. You know, that cutting costs in every corner, no matter what. And today with the pandemic, with these supply chains disruptions that we're seeing, the realities of what supply chains disruptions can, can do on a global scale, we're finally getting people to reconsider this uh, just-in-time supply chains and kind of lean closer 
to something like just in case supply chains, right? Especially for critical resources like pharmaceuticals and food and so on. And that's essentially what we've been talking about in the ecological economic space and the MMT and Green New Deal space, which is focusing on resilience to external shocks, resilience to these disruptions in the supply chains or in, in other factors. And resilience means doing things with a lower carbon footprint, doing things on a more regional scale. Doesn't mean that every little village will have its own independent closed economy, but it means on a regional uh, scale, not on a global scale, having more resilience for critical aspects of your um, daily needs and, and economic needs and social needs. That starts with a resilient, regionalized microgrids, renewable energy system. We know they're more resilient and we know they're cheaper cost, but it requires investment in renewables, in storage capacity and research and development. So that's on the energy sector. In terms of the food supply chains, we know that a healthier, uh, locally produced, sustainable agriculture system is much more resilient and is cost effective when we do it with the right kinds of investments and doing this across the system. And the healthcare industry, I don't have to give you dozens of examples. We all lived through the disruptions of the supply chains as it relates to PPE and, and so on. So starting with the basic foundations of our human needs and resilience and making sure that those factors are produced within reach, so to speak, in a more resilient, sustainable uh, setting. And, and that will give us all the resilience that we need uh, on, on all fronts. And that means rethinking the entire global financial, uh, uh, the global international trade system and supply chain system and, and, and kind of undoing a lot of the damage that's been done over the last 40 years. You know, that brings me to the patent laws. Obviously, the Modern Money Network spends a lot of time uh, explaining contract relations and credit relations and so forth. And, and these sorts of patent relations, these laws that are on the books that really defend uh, a very, very uh, antagonistic stance with countries that are developing. I mean, you see mm -hmm. this with the, the COVID vaccines. You see this with insane amounts of technology that could literally be saving the planet if we were to be able to share this technology. Talk to me about what patent law might look like in support of our economic system as we move forward to make it a more sustainable sharing economy. Well, there's a couple of things to keep in mind here. First is that these, these laws, inter intellectual property laws and private property laws are man-made. And they were invented and enforced and introduced with capitalism, and especially in the recent decades with WTO enforcement mechanisms. So that's point number one, which means these legal frameworks are, can be modified in, uh, and adjusted to serve the public purpose, to serve human needs. Number two, even in international law, there are exemptions. There are cases under which you are legally, in international law, you are legally allowed uh, exemptions from existing uh, rules and regulations and contracts and treaties, if you can uh, convince the, the system, a court system or the international legal system, that number one, the principle of necessity applies, or number two, the principle of impossibility applies. And these are legal principles that are used in, in courts all the time. And the best examples of this was the HIV AIDS uh, medicine, uh, whereby the, the formula for producing uh, those drugs is available and can be used by South African manufacturers, Indian manufacturers, Chinese manufacturers to produce those drugs at a virtually no cost, life-saving uh, drugs for countries that were dealing with massive outbreaks at the time, South Africa and, and China in particular. So those two countries said, you know what? We know the formula. We have the productive capacity to replicate the formula and save lives. We're going to do it, whether you like it or not, because this is necessity. This is saving human life. So the principle of necessity. And when they said that, the pharmaceuticals in, in the U.S. And, and Europe said, well, that's going to open a whole can of worms now. Everybody's going to claim the principle of necessity and, and, and go replicate our formulas and, and do it. So they understood that they couldn't stop those sovereign countries from doing the right thing to save lives. 
and they didn't want to look like the bad guys who refused to provide uh, life-saving drugs. So they, they signed an agreement. They made it more formal and legal to allow them to produce the generic drugs at a, essentially no cost uh, to, to them other than the cost of production. So they made it into a formal contract and, and they you know, walked out like the heroes who, who saved the world. When we tried to do the same thing with the vaccines, they said, no, you have to buy them. Right? And, and that's part of the reason why we're going to see hundreds of thousands of people uh, dying and suffering from COVID probably until the, re- the end of the decade, because I, I honestly don't see any end in sight in the spread of new variants. Because if you don't put a dent in terms of vaccination globally, there's going to be room for variants to emerge every few months. Uh, and as a result, you know, who knows how dangerous the next variants will be so far you know, for people who are vaccinated, we, we can manage, but the majority of the world is not vaccinated. Uh, so, um, so here we have to rethink, you know, what, uh, how far and how aggressively we use these legal principles to question the, the foundations of the existing uh, international uh, kind of uh, intellectual property uh, uh, legal system. That being said, set that aside, and think of the tremendous amount of intellectual property theft, you know, broadly speaking, from the global south by U.S.-based and global north-based corporations. Not recent, but for decades. Uh, think of um, uh, the um, what Vandana Shiva refers to as uh, as biopiracy, like uh, stealing. Mm-hmm indigenous knowledge in agriculture in the medical field and in so many important uh, areas and privatizing it turning it into you know a pill or a seed genetically modified seed that is resistant to droughts that is resistant to uh, petrochemicals and and, and and fertilizers and things like that and then selling it re-exporting it to the global south as intellectual property protected uh, genetically modified seeds or medicines or prescription drugs and so on. So where is the legal mechanism to go after the thieves, in this case, the pirates who pirated indigenous knowledge that was built by human civilizations in the global south over hundreds and hundreds of years, indigenous knowledge? Where is the intellectual property rights of indigenous artists who design the beautiful shapes and colors of so many uh, cultures in terms of their rugs and their carpets and their shirts and their tattoos and you name it. And then it's taken and privatized by, you know, uh, uh, companies that make billions of dollars selling indigenous looking t-shirts and sweaters and things like that. So if we're going to have a, a true form of, of reparations, the way I describe it, it's not only uh, kind of, making the case for climate reparations and colonial reparations, but colonial reparations will include this form of biopiracy, this form of uh, reparations for uh, cultural heritage appropriation by by the global north. So all the justifications for transfer of resources, financial and real resources to the global south, we can make a long list uh, to justify why we need to cancel the debt for the global south, why we need to repair the damage and build uh, a completely different international trade system that's based on, on, on justice. Um, so this is where the, the reparations concept uh, comes from. It's not about a, an exact dollar amount and then we continue doing the same thing over and over. It's about restoring, um, uh, restoring the planet, restoring ecosystems, and repairing the damage to indigenous communities uh, across the world. When you look at our approach to economic growth, I saw during the Reagan era that they used Russia and the Cold War as a means of exacerbating deficits, which obviously don't matter necessarily, but in the way that they were spent, they really kind of do. But they did expose that 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 myth of fearing deficits right there i think cheney famously said deficits don't matter reagan proved that this is basically the spoils of war um but here we are looking at china today 
and we're looking at the Biden administration. And the Biden administration has, in my estimation, taken a page out of Ronnie Ray Gunn's book and trying to make China the big bad enemy once again to ratchet up a new inspiration for uh, technological advance or whatever, using that us against them mindset to create another race to get us moving again. I hate that anybody would need an enemy like that to do the right thing, but apparently there are people out there who need an enemy. Is is that your understanding? And, and why are we positioning China in this respect? Is it is it something simple as, you know, hey, they're about to outpace us on size, or is this a tool to, to leverage the right-wing reactionaries in support of spending? I, I'm, I'm clueless as to why the heck we would try and create another Cold War of sorts. Yeah, it's, it, it's unfortunate that this is the, the reality in the U.S. Uh, political system. I think, uh, Steve, you're referring to a bill that was passed almost a year ago, I think, uh, for like uh, the federal government to invest in research and development. I forget what the bill was called. $50 billion, I believe. And it was essentially framed as an anti-China bill. And, and I think everybody voted for it. There was no exception. And that was one of the easiest ways to pass the bill is either have it as a military budget or to have it as an anti-China uh, policy. Um, uh, I, I think that's, that's uh, short-sighted and, and dangerous on, in the, on the part of the U.S. So instead of using your position as, as the most powerful nation uh, in the world, as the most technologically advanced country in the world, with the, the vast amount of resources and capabilities uh, and influence over other countries to lead the world in the right direction, uh, we're leading the world towards more conflict, uh, towards more animosity, uh, and towards self-destruction, really. We're destroying the American infrastructure. We're destroying uh, human lives, and we're not repairing any of the damage internally, let alone repairing the damage globally. So the, the whole foreign policy framing of the U.S. position in the world uh, is still stuck in a Cold War mentality, and it's not the mentality that we need to lead the world to, towards something like a global Green New Deal, a reparations framework where everybody wins. It's not, it's not just to the benefit of the U.S. or to the benefits of, uh, of China. So, Fadal, we're up against the time now. I want you to have the last word. What do you think? Because obviously, quick soapbox. There's no one talking about the Green New Deal right now except for MMTers, really. I mean, there's some other people I'm sure that are, too. It's just not anywhere near, you know, in the focus for Congress, for our Overton window. It's been slammed shut. I don't know how. With everything going on around us, I can't imagine anything more important at this point. But it's yep. not. It's got no energy whatsoever. And with that in mind, we see the, the rest of the world kind of almost living as if this isn't happening. And so I guess my question to you is with obvious changes we see melt down in Antarctica that is outrageously terrifying, an underwater melt. We're not even talking about surface level melt. So we're talking about that whole shelf dropping. We're talking about potential of massive, massive glaciers dumping straight into the ocean, displacing up to 10 feet of water. And we're talking about 100 mile high or 100 foot high tsunamis if that happens. I mean, we're talking about real end of days kind of scenarios if that were to happen. And there's no timetable because we don't have any understanding other than modeling of how that could occur. Help me yeah. make this yeah. the most important thing here. Well, a lot of people see the kind of climate change alarm bells ringing left and right. And, and they kind of paralyzed because they're, com they're convinced that there's very little we can do about it. Why? Because we don't have the money and we can't find the money and we can't tax enough. We can't borrow enough to do any of this. So all the people who have the deepest concerns for climate change, for all of these things that you're describing, Steve, are paralyzed because they've been trapped in an economic thinking framework that tells them there is no alternative. There is nothing we can do other than incremental policies and maybe hope for the best and maybe we'll, we'll save humanity. MMT, I believe, is the only framework here that allows us to think beyond that constraining framework of mainstream economics that says, you know, the inflation constraint is determined by uh, productive capacity, which the good news is producible. We can produce more of it, especially the countries 
and the global north with the largest volume of productive capacity, the largest amount of research and development capabilities, and the largest fiscal policy space. So we do have hope in that direction. If we shine a bright light and demonstrate that that is our way out. Number two, the countries with the um, uh, regulatory framework that would allow them to cleanse their political system of corruption and abuse and actually target the price setters, abusive price setters domestically and globally, that's another area where we can globally increase our fiscal spending capacity to tackle climate change. And the good news, we do it in, in the same way. We reduce corruption, we democratize the system, we increase productive capacity globally, and we do it without causing inflation, without bankrupting countries, and at the same time, tackling climate change on a much rapid pace than what most countries are currently planning on. So there is hope, but it takes educating, informing, mobilizing, organizing, so that we have the masses, as I say sometimes, well-informed pitchforks who can fight <laughs> with a coherent narrative, who can call their bluff when they say we don't have the money and we can't afford it. And that's, that's what keeps us going in terms of hope uh, so that we can uh, kind of rally uh, all the human capabilities that we have to push in the right direction uh, without the, the frustration and, and kind of anxiety that all the concern about climate change usually puts on all of us. Uh, that's what gives us hope. If we don't have that, I don't know where to find hope uh, other than knowing that a better world is within reach only if we unite and organize and put forward uh, a coherent, comprehensive strategy that happens to be very, very inconvenient for a relatively small amount of people around the world who happen to have control over um, governments, media, corporations, um, and too bad for them because we're, we're going to fight and we're going to try to save the world. Yeah, that's great. You know, Pavlina Chernova says that MMT is genuine hope, and I absolutely agree with that. Fadl, thank you so much for bringing the elbow of truth with us today. Folks, this is Steve Grumbine, the Rogue Scholar, with Fadl Kaboob, my guest. Thank you so much. Fadl can be found at thank Global you. Institute of Sustainable Prosperity, and he's got all kinds of other appearances to look for Fadl. Fadl, thank you so much for joining me today, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. You got it. All right, folks, this is Steve. We're out of here.